Good day everyone. Today I wanted to focus in on some things that were mentioned in the last Tartaria Explained video. I was really inspired by a video created years ago by New Earth. So shout out to her and I'll leave the video in the description. So let's just jump right in and talk about one of the most famous artists in the world, Leonardo da Vinci. We are all pretty much taught everything about him as children. We know his most famous paintings, yet there's a secret to these artworks that's been kept hidden by the Catholic Church. It's not just Leonardo's paintings either. It's essentially all the Renaissance artwork up until the end of the 18th century. These artworks to this day cannot be truly replicated. Their beauty and glow are unrivaled by any modern artist. And no, I'm not saying that artists today do not have the skill to replicate or get extremely close to these artworks. I'm just saying that it's not possible to replicate these artworks because they use very specific techniques. This came to light once forgeries from this period were examined. Truth is, there are a lot of people that can get extremely close to Leonardo's style and then attempt to sell it as an original for an absurd amount of money. But how do we know when an artwork is a forgery? First, we have to take a look at the science that they've released to the public about this matter. They've looked so close up to these paintings with modern microscopes to reveal that there are several layers of ultra-thin paint. For example, the laboratory of the Center for Study and Restoration of Museums and the European Laboratory of Synchrotron Radiation have recently joined forces to reveal the secrets of Leonardo's skill. The study was led by Dr. Felipe Walter. The scientists use a technique called X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. In this way, you can study the structure of layers without taking samples, i.e. without disturbing the canvas. A powerful X-ray beam was sent into the canvas. The structure of the layers and the composition were then determined. This was the results. Each layer of glaze is two microns thick, which is 50 times thinner than a human hair. In some parts of the painting, the total thickness of all layers of glaze is 55 microns, which means that the master repeatedly applied layer by layer to achieve the desired effect. And remember, this is at a time where they had to grind all their paints by hand and create all the different hues themselves. If we follow the mainstream narrative, they did not possess the technology that could grind a layer of paint this thin. If we consider paints today, they are ground down with modern mills and they achieve a pigment particle size from 15 to 55 microns. Getting it to the thinnest possible size requires time and expensive technology. On average, most of the paint that we use nowadays is around 30 microns thick. So, how did Leonardo manage to paint at such an unbelievably thin size? No one really knows this, and it's the reason that art historians know that these old Renaissance artworks cannot be replicated. So let's discuss some possible answers for this mystery. If you've seen our videos before, then you know that this very well may be from a secret past advanced civilization. It's very possible that these works were all made by other people and simply credited under one artist, one maybe who came from Italy or the Jesuit church, in order to take credit for these phenomenal works from another age. Many artists and dates were likely altered in order to fit their narrative. It's also possible that when this new church took over, they found the advanced technology from that past civilization and created the most beautiful artworks that we know today. There are some technologies that we know of, such as the camera obscura, which consists of a box, tent, or room with a hole on one side or the top. Light from this external scene passes through the hole and strikes the surface inside, where the scene is reproduced, inverted, and reversed but with color and perspective preserved. It's well known that these were used as drawing aids in the 16th century or perhaps earlier in the mainstream timeline. And this could explain the significant increase in realism that we see during the Renaissance and why these advanced artists seemingly popped out of nowhere. A similar device, Camera Lucida, performs an optical superimposition of the subject being viewed upon the surface upon which the artist is drawing. The artist sees both the scene and the drawing surface simultaneously, as in the photogenic double exposure. This allows the artist to duplicate key points of the scene on the drawing surface, thus aiding in the accurate rendering of perspective. Then we have the sfumato effect. It's one of the canonical painting modes of the Renaissance, and is a painting technique for softening the transition between colors. 
mimicking an area beyond what the human eye is focusing on or on the out of focus plane. It is well known that Leonardo did indeed use the camera obscura and experimented with lenses. The technique is a fine shading meant to produce a soft transition between colors and tones in order to achieve a more believable image. It's most often used by making subtle gradations that do not include lines or borders, from areas of light to areas of dark. The technique was not only used to give an elusive and illusionistic rendering of the human face, but also to create rich atmospheric effects. Leonardo da Vinci was its founder and described the technique as blending colors without the use of lines and borders in the manner of smoke. The perfection of Leonardo da Vinci's painting technique has always been fascinating. The gradation of tones or colors from light to dark is barely perceptible. Neither brushwork nor contour is visible. Lights and shades are blended in a manner of smoke. Understanding this technique, usually called sfumato, remains one of the challenges still unaddressed in art history. So you have to think that these brushstrokes are not visible in any way, and that also there were several coats of translucent glaze in order to achieve this effect. Let's keep in mind that these artists were achieving extreme realism. If we look at the painting named the Arnolfini portrait, John van Eyck, we can see a painting of absolute insane detail from the early 15th century. Now, look at the shine to the metal and the level of realism in the mirror. Even using technology such as the camera obscura, you could only get so much detail. The lighting would change over time, subjects would move, and we're just to assume that these artists were capturing all these details of these lights and shades in their minds, or recalling them from memory? You could possibly have enough time to use the lens technology to create a realistic sketch with perspective, but I don't think you would have enough time to paint this level of realism with just this technology of lenses and mirrors and having to paint multiple layers of glazes. They would need time to dry in between application, and so these artists must have had something else, or a photographic memory. Maybe they had another technology that was never revealed. Let's take another look at Van Eyck's paintings because I believe that these might just be the most realistic paintings of the Renaissance due to their lighting. Now let's remember that some of these paintings are from the early 1400s, so this is quite astonishing that this level of realism was achievable during this time period. Maybe there are some clues in the paintings. The first thing that is off about these paintings is the lighting on the man's face and the window. If you look at the exposure of the window, it just seems way too realistic. It almost looks as if it was a 3D rendering in the way light scatters around the subjects. I also find it very interesting that many of the figures in these old paintings have this very surreal feel that they look very different in terms of being human, like many of the women don't even have eyebrows. Now as we zoom in on the mirror, you can see that it's ornamented with even smaller paintings with extreme detail. You can also see that the exposure of the window and the lighting stay consistent even in the reflection. And if you look at the cleanliness of the font, to me it just really shows that there's something else going on, especially if you look at the shoes. If you just take a look at the shoes up close, if it weren't for the cracks in the painting, I mean that looks like a realistic 3D rendering, or honestly real life. It's just too detailed for any artist during this time period, and no artist even comes close to this level of realism. Let's go to another painting called the Ghent Altarpiece, or as the file name calls it, the Lamb Gods. Not only does this have extreme realism, but take a look at the background. Does this remind you of anything? Now let's just say that he was using a camera obscura. This city looks extremely Tartarian, something he maybe drew from real life. Interesting that this artwork is branded with the date 1432. Here's another painting with a crazy amount of detail. The male's face almost looks like a photograph, and if we look at the background, we see a busy Tartarian city. As we've mentioned, these artworks have layers and layers of pigments that are less than 2 microns thick. How is it possible for them to achieve this size of pigment particles? It seems unlikely that the story we are told of these artists simply doing this all by hand is the answer to this question. The only thing comparable in the modern day is that of printing inks. Printing pigments are obtained in a very difficult chemical way. 
With these methods, the particles are grown, crystallized, in a certain medium at once by very small crystals. Then, of course, compressed sediment is still dried and ground. But this is not at all like crushing a whole stone. As a result of such modern and expensive chemical processes, for example, the following pigments are obtained in varied sizes between 0.1 and 10 microns. How was it that Leonardo could compete with our modern advanced chemical methods with just a mortar and pestle? These artworks from the Renaissance are not what we've been told. They were printed using some sort of advanced ancient technology from the past. Many of these figures were indeed alchemists. They possessed the ability and knowledge of the Philosopher's Stone, the process in which you could convert base metals into precious metals. Or was it a tincture or powder that could be influenced through a mental process in which the image within the mind of the viewer could be transferred onto the canvas? This technology belonged to the old world, and this and many other magical devices have been hidden from mankind. There is a reason why these artworks are so famous, and it's because of their esoteric nature, their ability to influence the spirit and the magical process in which they're created. We must always question the mainstream narrative, and only then may our minds be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?